This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts, the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Freshwater fishing opportunities abound in Mississippi, with more than 4,000 miles of streams and 282,000 acres of lakes and reservoirs. Today, we welcome back Dennis Rickey from the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks to talk fishing and the Ramps and Piers program. Where are the ramps located? Who can use them? And I think everybody wants to know what's biting this time of year. Also, Dr. Major is ready to take pet questions. Libby wants to talk about your latest brushes with nature. So join our conversation with your phone call this morning, 1-877-MPB-RING. It's 1-877-672-7464. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Always like to remind you that if you miss Creature Comforts on Thursdays, it repeats Saturday mornings at 6. So good morning, Uh, Libby. Let's uh, start out with you. Uh, We have an email here that says, uh, found this bunting. Well, Kevin, we're trying to get Libby on the line. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry about that. I jumped the gun a little bit. Um, Maybe Dr. Major, let's talk to him. I see that he's on the line with us. That is correct. All right. Uh, Good morning, Dr. Major. Uh, You know, we talk about this frequently, but as this heat really persists and gets to be really unbearable, uh, let's remind folks of some things. First of all, just general precautions for your pets uh, and and this hot weather. Absolutely, it's uh, a brutal. What should I say? Brutal early summer. I guess it still is early summer, but uh, these high temperatures take a toll on man and beast. And certainly, uh, we've got to allow shade, water, uh, you know, this type of thing for all of our pets. Uh, make sure that they. Uh, what shall I say, not allowed to be in a car, for example, unattended at all. Uh, that's tantamount to death in just a short period of time. And be careful when you're out walking. Try to walk early in the morning or late in the afternoon to walk your pets. And be careful of that asphalt. It really does not lose a lot of heat and can be quite damaging to your pet's feet. Yeah, that's one that you've told us before, and I think it's a good one. You know, I was playing tennis with some friends the other day, and I had, you know, um, an igloo cooler with some water in it, and I had set it on the surface of the tennis court, and by the time we finished, an hour and a half later, the plastic was actually warm in the bottom of my water jug. So I think that's a an example of, of how hot it can be and how hot reflective materials like asphalt and that sort of thing uh, can be. You mentioned uh, water. Is it important to uh, p- periodically... Check on the water, make sure, you know, maybe re- change the water, put fresh water out for our pets? Absolutely, and I like water containers for the outside dogs that cannot be turned over. If it's a heavy uh, crock or something like that, it's good, but make sure that it won't get turned over, and hopefully uh, you don't have any dogs that are chained out or tied out. Uh, they can easily turn over a, a container of water with a, a chain. So I don't recommend that, but I know that it has to be done in certain instances. But make sure that they can't turn that water over and make sure it's fresh. Uh, Our dogs would like uh, fresh water just like we would. And we're talking about dogs. There are some outdoor cats, but I think it's it's more uh, that dogs, I guess, that we kind of worry about. And, and dogs aren't dumb, so they kind of know on their own if there are ways they can go in the yard that might be in the shade, that sort of thing. They know where to go. We just need to make sure they've got some opportunities to, to get in the shade or get to the water. Right. They need to have access uh, to shade and water. And if possible, and you can always put a fan out uh, on the patio or wherever, garage, uh, where you can get some air circulation, which which will help. Uh, I've often said this, and I think it's true. How many of you have ever seen a cat going down the street in the midday sun? <laughs> Very rarely. However, dogs uh, aren't quite as smart about that. Usually the cats are going to be holed up somewhere, the outside cats, and not be out in that terrible sun. Uh, so uh, what would be some signs that maybe our pets, and again, pr- primarily dogs, but s- some signs that the dogs might be getting to suffer from excessive heat? Right. Uh, 
you talk about heat exhaustion or heat versus heat stroke, but really there would be excessive panning, and that's how dogs kept to ameliorate or let the heat out of their body panning uh, primarily. Uh, you can see where they become exhausted and not wanting to get up and do anything. Uh, heat stroke, on the other hand, is a very real thing, and you can get temperatures of up to 105 to 107 uh, uh, body temperature. So these are this needs immediate attention, and uh, it's cooling down. And we usually try to cool down in a slow fashion from the standpoint of not using packing ice or anything that like that around the, uh, the dog's body. Uh, water is okay as far as a water bath. And also, a lot of times people will use alcohol on the feet to help. It seems to help actually uh, lift, help that temperature down. But it is dangerous. And if you have a dog with heat stroke, you really need to get emergency care. All right. Yeah. And again, that's, you know, this is something that we've talked about, but with this heat, the way it just doesn't seem to want to dissipate. I think it was important to uh, remind folks of this. And I'd like to remind everybody, because this is a serious one, as you mentioned, Dr. Major, don't leave your, your pet or your child for that matter in a hot car, in a car, no matter how quickly you think you can run into the store, do whatever, those temperatures inside of a, a, of a closed car can escalate so quickly that we need to make sure that our pets and our people are safe. Remember that Remember that uh, your dog is in the car, and they can lock the door. They can turn it off somehow. I'm just saying that a lot of cars will stop running after a certain period of time, but they can lock it and lock you out. So you've got to be careful with that. Uh, Libby has joined us now. So, Libby, are you you still out west in Oregon? I am, yes. All right. So make us jealous. Give us an idea of what the weather's like out there. Hey, I'm looking at the thermometer on the patio. It's 60 degrees. <laughs> we, you know, we we do get some some hot weather during the day. We've had over 100 degrees since we've been here. Uh, this last week has not been that hot, though. I'm so sorry you're having to deal with it in Mississippi, but we know it's coming every year, don't we? Yep, yeah, it's, it's it's especially brutal this year, though. I think uh, we were reporting this morning on the news that they're setting marks for the highest overnight low temperatures. And that, to me, is is just mind-boggling. But uh, we're we're all struggling through. Uh, We do have an email for you. This one says, uh, I think they sent a picture along, found this bunting stuck in my greenhouse about three weeks ago. I captured it and released it outside. It flew in a southwesterly direction. Haven't seen it since. First, if you would, give us an idea of what uh, painted buntings look like and how common are they in Mississippi? Oh, well, they're absolutely beautiful. It's a, you know, a small bird and um, it's got blues and reds and yellows and greens, the male. And I'm assuming this was a male because they're so colorful. And that's generally how we immediately see painted bunting is when we see the male. The female is, um, you know, kind of a tan little, tans and browns, also a beautiful little bird, but uh, not those vivid colors that the male has, and uh, they're seed eaters, uh, but tend to, um, they, you know, they want a prairie kind of habitat. They want a, uh, an old abandoned field, something like that. They tend to nest low in bushes along a fence row or something, I guess, is a traditional way to, to have found them, and um we had them on our property when we first moved out there because they were abandoned fields. But as um, things have grown up and trees have been planted, you know, over the 40 years, I rarely see a painted bunting anymore. We had blue gross beaks and painted buntings and indigos. We still have the indigos. They tolerate a little bit more vegetation than, than painted do, but an uh, absolutely beautiful bird and a very sought-after bird by people who like to who like to watch and photograph birds. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. We've got an early caller, so let's take uh, one before our first break as we say good morning to Janice calling in from Hattiesburg. Good morning, Janice. What do you have for us? Good good morning. Um, I have a um, healer border collie mix. Um, He chooses to, to 
went out walking just a little bit. I'm trying to keep him inside in this heat, but I have to walk him. And then he wants to just lie down in the sun and stay there. I, I don't understand this. It's a good question. Uh, I've seen dogs of my own do that. Uh, I had a little chihuahua named J.W. who's deceased now, but he would pick a day and go out and lie on the patio in the hottest of the day and sit there for a while. They wouldn't stay out there real long, but I well, wanted, I... To get him a, wanted to get him a pair of sunglasses that was so bright, but uh, <laughs> he wouldn't tolerate that. Uh, yeah. I don't know that I have the answer to that. Uh, there are some dogs that do that, and I would not want to leave them out real long in this type of heat, but uh, it's probably fairly normal for some dogs to want to do that. I know well, that's not the answer you wanted, but at the same time, maybe somebody <laughs> else could help us out with that. Well, he has, you know, a coat, pretty heavy coat. And I, another question is, should, should I see a lot of people shaving their dogs, and I just have to wonder about that it in the summertime. The it depends on the dog and the breed. Some of the dogs are more prone to moist eczema, which we call hot spots. And mm-hmm. that can certainly be a problem with a thick coat. The thick coat does provide some insulation, but it also, if it's moist or damp, can be like cooking in it as well. So uh, some of the Siberian Huskies and healers and this sort of thing, people do shield them, uh, and I think they do okay with that. At the same time, the hair may not grow back exactly like it was. One thing to consider. Mm-hmm. Well, I just, you know, you, you read do that, and then you read that, you know, it's um, they have a double coat, and, and it does help keep them cool. So it's just very confusing, and this is just a horrible year for pets. I mean, I've already, I did, he did have heat issues, and I spent several hundred dollars on July 4th. Right. Um, but due to that, and that that's just why I don't understand. Uh, he walks on asphalt, but it, you, it's too hot to walk on and yet he walks on it okay. I just, um <laughs> it's just confusing and this time and this year has been especially you know very concerning for for pets so i right. just guess there's no answer to my question and i understand well, I, that i would say also that if if you have a dog that has the hot spots or moist eczema i would tend to have that dog sheared if this dog is not having that type problem just be aware that he could still overheat, even though he has that protective coat. Good luck to you. Yeah, that's thank you. All right, Janice, uh, thanks for your call. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Time for our first break of the hour. When we get back, we'll welcome back our guest, fisheries biologist, Dennis Rickey. We'll discuss the Ramp and Piers program with the Wildlife Department and what you need to do to catch your next showfish. Also, Dr. Major will remain on the line ready for your pet questions. So give us a call to join our conversation today. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 Email animals at mpbonline.org. Back with more after this. Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking, is a show that explores issues that relate to you and your family. To find out what we're all about, subscribe to the podcast by using any podcast app or by downloading our MPB public media app. We're back on Creature Comforts. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest for the hour is Dennis Rickey. We're talking about the uh, fishing in the state uh, and uh, we would like for you to join our conversation this morning with a phone call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. 
So, Dennis, good to have you back on the program. Something that we talked about briefly before we came on the air, and we were talking with Dr. Major about this awful heat with our pets. What, what, how does the, the, the severe heat affect fish? Um, it, it affects them. that They're cold-blooded, so they have a certain preferred temperature range. And so they always are seeking water temperatures that are in that range. Uh, so um, I would expect them not to be deeper generally where it's cooler think about if you you've ever been in a farm pond in the summer and your shoulders are and your chest is is warmer temperature the the temperature of the water around that part of your body is warmer than at your feet uh same same type of thing in in larger water bodies um so they'll seek so seek shady areas where there's trees along the bank and the sunlight isn't directly hitting the surface of the water um, at a, at high temperatures, they uh, feed less. It's just an uncomfortable for them. It's a, it's a stressor. Um, and I can tell you that that uh, I was on a call recently with biologists, and we were talking about stream temperatures, and they're concerned about now with our seemingly um, uh, warmer water temperatures in the summer that. The, the low temperature at night in the stream is not getting down to where it was in previous years. So they think this is affecting some species like smallmouth bass, which uh, prefer you know lower temperatures. The only place we have smallmouth bass in Mississippi is in the northeast. Yeah. Uh, so as an advice maybe to people who are going out fishing, one, I guess, avoid the hot sun like we say for everybody, but also maybe try to find areas that look cooler to where the fish might be. That's right. You know, generally if you're in a boat, you know, fish deeper, fish some ledges with structure, things like that. If you're on a bank, uh, look for some, some shade over the surface of the water. So the last time you were with us, you talked about uh, the fishing report as a great resource to see what's happening in our Mississippi waters. How can people report what they're catching to contribute to that fishing report? I believe, um, well, you can certainly call us and we'll take that report at the, at the main office or uh, we can put you in touch with the biologist of that, that region and he or she would be happy to take uh, reliable reports. Uh, sometimes people complain to us, how come you don't have a fishing report on this water body? Well, people expect those to be different each week, certainly, you know, uh, understandably so, uh, so that it's the most current conditions. And But if we don't have uh, consistent reports, we can't change them, you know. So um, just give us a call, and, and we can we can make you one of the, the uh, sources that we use. So uh, if folks go out fishing this time of year, what, what are they liable to catch this, uh, in the Mississippi? Uh, you you could still catch all the, the the major game fish species this time uh, bass bluegill crappie red ear channel cat a uh, blue cat flatheads you know the, the people that the 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 uh, fish that are highly sought after but most people fish now for um, catfish that's that's the the principal species sought in in spillways. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're going to be visiting with Dennis throughout the hour. We do have a caller on the line with it looks like a pet question, so let's uh, invite Melanie to the show. Uh, Good morning. You're on the air with us. Go ahead. Thank you. So I have a question. I have an outdoor dog. It's a a border collie. I've been buying for myself these mosquito repellent bands. They they look like the old-fashioned curly telephone cord line, (laughs) uh, except smaller. And I was wondering, uh, my dog has, we fought the battle and lost to keep her out from under the house because I guess it's cooler and not as many bugs under there. But I was wondering if I could just put one of these around her neck because they're plenty big. It's geranium oil, lemongrass oil, and citronella oil, and it really works. So I I wear them myself, but not 24 hours a day, I guess, is what makes me a little bit worried about putting it on her and leaving it on her. You know, I don't know about the use for dogs, but it sounds like it should be safe. Be sure not to have a long piece hanging down that she could get in her mouth to chew on. Right. Uh, 
to make it fairly, well, not real snug, but uh, make it where you could get three or four fingers under it uh, as you put it on her neck. Right. I would watch for any signs of irritation if she starts scratching excessively there, uh, or if you see any type of uh, sores or anything like that, certainly take it off. Right. But uh, based on what you said the ingredients were, I'd say that probably it's safe. Okay, because I feel like I feel guilty when I go out there and, and I'm protected against. And, and I've tried just, you know, misting around her with an insect repellent, and if, now she, if she sees the insect repellent, can she runs away <laughs> Understood. i think it's because she probably breathes it in you know and it's really unpleasant but maybe maybe, there. maybe if you could report back to us on how, how it does okay Alrighty. Yeah, you know okay thank, thank you, you. Thanks, Melanie, for the call. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. If you have a question for our guest, fisheries biologist Dennis Rickey, or for Dr. Major, or you want to report a wildlife experience that you've recently encountered, give us a call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring You can call us at one 672 7464 or send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. So, Dennis, if you had to put a percentage on it, uh, how much of the state's fishing is done on the bank and how much is done on a boat? Probably, I'd say, uh, 60% from boat, maybe 40% from bank. Maybe I got those reversed. It just depends upon your your means and 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 if you want uh, what satisfies you, what you can afford, uh, what you'd like to explore. You know, I think bank anglers they, they're there and say, well, "What if I could fish that over there?" Well, I need a boat to do that. Well, and now um, you know with kayaks and canoes that are that are made for fishing, you can get into it for uh, you can have a boat. Uh, and and access those places for a lot uh, less money than you could before. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the the ramp and piers program. Uh, what is that exactly? Okay, we have a it's called the boating access um, for the ramp program, and and we have a pier program for to help people get out in deeper water, to help handicap anglers um, get out over the water, um, and uh, we. Since probably the mid 1980s, have uh, certain individuals we employ that uh, that build ramps and piers. We have a barge that they built. Uh, we uh, do the site preparation, grading the banks, and and forming it up for concrete, uh, or uh, driving the poles and the runners and the headers and all that support stuff. I don't know the name of that supports the deck of the pier uh so um we get uh part of the 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 money that the states get from when people buy uh fishing gear and buy a uh, line and uh gasoline to go in boats comes back to the states it's a user pay system and and 15 percent of that money each state uh, has to use for boating access. So this is where the funds come from, the ramps and the piers. Yeah. Uh, so how many boat ramps are there across Mississippi? Well, we have about 175 that we built or, or maintain, but we know of about uh, several hundred um, all across the state, and, and some may be on National Wildlife Refuges and uh, Forest Service land or Pat Harrison Waterway Parks, or some maybe if uh, individuals who have land adjacent to a water body sometimes build their own ramp and they charge a small fee for people to uh, launch. Um, so is there a way to find out where the boat ramps are in Mississippi? Yes, there is. And uh, we get calls about this, and uh, I think it's, it's a great resource on, on our website which is uh, www.mdwfp.com. At the top, if you click on Fishing and Boating, a little menu will come up on the left-hand side of the screen, and it'll say Ramps and Piers. And let's say 
you wanted to go fishing on the Wolf River. Well, you can search by water body on that 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 site, or you might say, eh, you know, I live in Holmes County. Let's just see what's around me. And so you can search by county too, and it'll come up with a list of of all the ramps, uh, either by water body or county, and it'll have GPS locations. It'll have, when you click on the ramp, it'll have directions. Uh, it'll have uh, some general stuff about, like, if the ramp is concrete or gravel or dirt, is it, can it accommodate two boats at a time? Is there a parking area? Is there restrooms? That type of thing. And I would imagine that um, people boat for reasons other than fishing. So is this primary for anglers, or can any boat access these the ramps? No, it's for, for any any uh, boat use. Whether you want to go skiing, you just want to cruise around, uh, it, any boat use is, is, is uh, acceptable, yes. And is there a process to ask for additional ramps? Yes. Uh, it's not a formal process, but people call us up and... Uh, they might, you know, say, well, I live in such and such or I fish this water body and the nearest ramp is, you know, the way down there. And and uh, so could we have a ramp? Uh, could you see about putting a ramp, say, one we always wanted was like below the waterworks curve at Ross Barnett? Because there's a weir there that they intake water for, for the um, Jackson water supply. And so the next ramp is way down there, and I think it's Georgetown, Rockport, Vanilla, something like that. Uh, so what we're what we would do was we would see uh, compare their location where they want the ramp to the nearest ramp that we have, decide if that's something we desire or not w- would be good, and then the process for us is we either have to buy land for access to build the boat ramp on, or seek a lease. So people enter lease agreements with us for 20, 25 years, and uh, we'll build a ramp uh, on their land uh, that the public can use. Uh, So we know about hunting and fishing licenses. Uh, Is there any licensure required for boating? No, not outside to register your boat like you'd register your car, you know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is Creature Comforts. Time for another break. When we get back, we'll continue our discussion with our guest today, Dennis Rickey, about Mississippi waters. And we talked a little bit about the Ramps and Piers program. Dr. Major is still on the line, ready for your pet questions. So if you want to join our conversation this morning, the number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 Send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. We'll have more after this, so stay tuned. Hey, this is Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. Each week, myself or one of my fellow hosts bring you in-depth interviews with different creative Mississippians. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio. Or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcasting app. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio, and today we're visiting with Dennis Rickey from the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. We're talking about fishing today with Dennis, and it looks like we have got a caller on the line. So it's our friend, whoop, I'm sorry, we're, uh, uh, the color hasn't changed from light green to orange yet, so I was jumping the gun a little bit again. So I apologize for that. We'll get Mike on the air in just a minute. Uh, in the meantime, Dennis, let's talk a little bit about fish sampling. What is the fish sampling program? Okay, so this is uh, one of the principal purposes of uh, uh, of job duties of a biologist. Um, uh, I think it's really misunderstood by the public what, what, what we do based on my interactions with them. Usually they ask us, uh, they think that we test the water to see if the fish are safe to eat. And th- there's other people that, that uh, do uh, fish sampling in, in terms of contaminants and things like that. But the principal purpose of a biologist is to is to take a, a, a sample, uh, 
a small group of fish that they collect either with electricity, uh, chemicals, we use chemicals sometimes, but not too much anymore, and, or nets, hoop nets, gill nets. And what we're interested in is from that sample, we're looking, we're taking a snapshot of the population, is um, we, we weigh the fish and we also <coughs> excuse me, measure the fish and we're getting at a, you know, we look at that, we plot that all out and we look at, we can look at year classes, peaks in the graph where we know that these are certain age fish just by the abundance of them in the population. We can also age fish with their scales or bones inside of them, the inner ear bones that they have. So all this is coming down to let's look at the, the types of fish in the water body, how fast they're growing, how many year classes they are, are they in their good condition or not based on their weight, the length and their weight. And so what do we need to do there? Is stocking needed? Do we need to, is there not too many young fish? So do we need to restrict the harvest of the adults to build up the population? We could do that with a minimum length limit. If there's plenty of fish and the growth is seem to slow and the condition factor is not quite right, well, we need to remove some. So we need to encourage harvest. We might increase the daily limit and we might put a slot limit on to encourage the harvest of small fish, protect a medium-sized fish, and hopefully have some bigger fish. Yeah. You know, again, we were talking during the break uh, about uh, Simpson Lake uh, it, there near McGee, and it has been reconstructed, I guess, over the last couple of years, and it looks like the reservoir, the lake itself, is, is, is looking nice. But as we mentioned, you need time to restock the lake and for the fish population to take hold. So Simpson Lake, not quite ready to open, but you were telling me it's on the horizon. That's correct. So with Simpson, sometimes we just, we will drain a lake and renovate it because uh, we want to improve the fish population. And and that's one of the quickest ways to do that. So basically starting all over, like you'd start over with a pond and, uh, you know, drain it, restock it with certain uh, numbers of fish and certain species of fish and give them time to develop. Simpson also, uh, the, pr the principal reason that we re renovated Simpson is uh, to do dam work. And that's probably more of a reason uh, to, for us to renovate lakes than any other reason. Uh, you need, um, perhaps you have a slough, uh, the dam is not uh, in the shape that it, it should be. You need to replace a, a drain valve or, or something like that. So for Simpson, it was a combination of emergency spill work, spillway work and flattening the slope that you see when you drive down 49. It was too steep, flattening the slope on the backside of the dam. And so once all that work's done, we, we put water back in the lake and we restock at a certain uh, time of year. The, the bass uh, go in, well, first of all, in like December, the bluegill and the catfish and the red ear go in, and the next spring we put the bass in. And so in that two-year period from when we stock the bass, the populations are going to develop, and we'll sample it throughout that two years, and we'll determine uh, when we should reopen it and what the, the, the length and daily limit regulation should be when we reopen it. And so that there is another example of, of the fish sampling that we were talking about just a few minutes ago. Yeah, and Simpson's going to open sometime the summer or fall of uh, 2023. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. We've got Mike on the line from Hernando now. So let's in, bring him on the air. Mike, uh, thanks for calling us. What do you have for us today? A uh, question for you guys. Um, I'm a writer up here in DeSoto County. I've written for several magazines. Years ago, I did a story south down 55, I-55 runs from uh, DeSoto County down the western side of the state, and I got down somewhere around Batesville or south of Batesville, and there's a huge facility there on the east side of I-55, big brick building, and it has something to do with wildlife and fisheries, and I was wondering, is that a hatch, or is that someplace the public can visit? There's gigantic buildings and apparently a lot of ponds. And I was wondering if that's part of the effort of where you guys are. You said you said south of Batesville? Well, somewhere around Batesville. I mean, it's been several years since I was down there. It may have been north of Batesville, but it was off I-55, 
heading on further south into the state, and I saw this gigantic facility on my left, and it's big, big sign says Mississippi State. I thought it said wildlife and fisheries, and I'm trying to figure out what it was and if it's the public can visit it. Yes, I think you're talking about the the North Mississippi Fish Hatchery and Visitor Center. It's a it's at mile marker or exit like two thirty three, I think it is, and you can okay. see it from from the interstate. It's at Enid, and um, Enid. Okay. Enid, yeah, and there was a bridge and a road there that that went over the emergency spill where it's been fixed. But yeah, there's there's an aquarium there and there's some displays. And it's where uh, we raise fish uh, to stock out in um, in public waters. And we can visit that. We could go there and see the facility. Yeah, and on our website, it's got the the hours and the days that it's open. And there's a small fee, I think two or three dollars to go through the the visitor center. Yeah. Oh, I'd like to see it. Okay, it's the North Mississippi Fish Hatchery. All righty, thank you. I'll look that up online. All right, Mike, good to hear from you again this morning. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Let's uh, stay on the phone lines because next we've got Trish on the line. Good morning, Trish. You're on the air with us. Go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. I was wondering if there's a way I can fish for brim in a pond that has lots of catfish in it. Well, what I would suggest is... You could fish for them with uh, crickets or worms uh, close to the surface. Uh, they would keep it shallow. Yeah. Um, or you could fly fish for them if you know how to fly fish. Uh, you could fish with little um, spinner baits. Um, uh. catfish, or, catfish will bite all of those things, but they're usually, you know, running along the bottom and okay. but don't don't use something that smells like um uh liver or uh a stink bait because that that's what catfish prefer and you you wouldn't okay. uh, you wouldn't catch brim with that uh try also you know you can just do some dough balls uh you know some bread you know, roll up some bread in your hand, okay. put it on a small hook. The thing to remember about bluegill is they have a very small mouth. It's like their mouth is, if you look at your, the size of your little finger, their mouth is that small. Hmm. And catfish has Ooh. a bigger mouth. So tend to use small hooks. Small hooks. Okay. Okay. Good. Thanks. I appreciate that. All right, Trish, thanks for your call. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Uh, to kind of wrap up our conversation about fish sampling, uh, what types of fish are sampled, and is, how does the do you determine where and, and what type of fish to sample? So we usually we sample in with electrofishing, which is our main uh, sampling technique. We will sample for uh, bass, crappie, um, bluegill, red ear. Uh, we can control the the uh, electrofishing settings to sample for catfish, but we concentrate on the main sport fish species that people are interested in. Yeah, there's other type of sampling in streams and where you can use, um, you know, seines and you can use backpack electrofishing and and then in rivers you could use hoop nets and we've done some of that for some specialized studies. Yeah. Time for one last break this hour. We're talking today with our guest Dennis Rickey about fishing. Dr. Major still here, ready to take your pet questions. Join our conversation this morning. The number is one eight seven seven MPB Ring. It's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Back to wrap things up after this. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest for this hour is fisheries biologist Dennis Rickey. 
you want to join our conversation with a question or comment, we've got some open phone lines. So give us a call at one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 Email animals at mpbonline.org. Here's a reminder, if you missed any of today's programs, you can always subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app or download the MPB Public Media app for your smartphone. So, Libby, I think uh, you had a story you wanted to tell us. Yes, um, it's about a bald-faced hornet nest that we found in our backyard. And um, I think a lot of people are familiar with hornet nests. The way I've seen them is talking about boats and fishing in boats. Uh, canoeing or fishing or um, being out on the water, you know, looking up over the water, a lot of times you'll see a big hornet nest that, you know, you need to not tarry, keep going, you know, don't stay too close to them. They're very defensive of their nest. But uh, I was playing with the kids in the backyard here in Corvallis, and we've got a a good-sized cherry tree, and one of the kids just looked up and pointed and it was a, a tiny little, I'd never seen one so small, uh, you know, fit easily in your hand, little bitty but unmistakable the way it was built. It was a hornet's nest. And uh, so I moved the kids away but didn't see any activity, and it was so small, I knew it had to be, you know, an early one. The queens emerge uh, either from leaf litter or bark on the tree. You know, maybe she overwintered right there in that cherry tree. And it um, looked like she had started her, her nest, spun it around. So we moved the kids, looked around, and then uh, the hornet is, oh gosh, more than an inch long, you know, maybe approaching two inches almost. And uh, she flew out, and uh, a scrub jay, which is kind of like a blue jay, our version of a blue jay here out west, just swooped right in and got her. Hmm. So there's no hornet there. And Paul and I discussed, you know, it doesn't look like anything has emerged yet. This is such a tiny little thing. So uh, later in the afternoon, he decided to take it down. Norman wanted to see inside of it, of course. So we, we cut it open, and there were eight little cells in there with white larvae in them. And uh, no adults, you know, nothing has hatched yet. So, uh, you know, all's well that ends well, I guess. But uh, we didn't mind having a hornet nest, but I wasn't sure as it got larger. I mean, they can have as, you know, it can get as big as, you know, 500, 700 hornets living in there. So I was thinking, this is not really what I want right here in the backyard anyway. (laughs) And the scrub jay took care of that for me. And it was a, a nice fat meal for one of the scrub jay babies, I imagine. You know, every time we have a story like that about what goes on in nature, I remember that old show on TV, like, why do you think they call them animals? So that's <laughs> that's nature at work, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not always happy about the scrub jay. I know sometimes the scrub jay will steal chickadee eggs out of the chickadee nest. And, you know, that's upsetting to the chickadees and to me. But at this point, the scrub jay did just what we wanted her to do. All right. We've got a caller on the line, so we're going to say good morning to Mike, who has called in this morning from Jackson. Mike, you're on the air with us. Go ahead. All right. Thanks for taking my call. I was just curious, are the Asian carp affecting Mississippi waterways? Well, they're spreading. Um, They're in all in the Mississippi River Basin and in the uh, Yazoo River Basin. And we just got some word, uh, some captures or sightings in Montgomery Pool and uh, Aberdeen Pool down the Ten Tom Waterway. Uh, There's some limited information that one of our biologists did with a a sampling technique that I mentioned, uh, chemicals. And we used, um, we block off an acre of water adjacent to the shore and put this chemical in and and uh, basically it allows us to collect all the fish. We, we kill them in that one acre. And so we compared data that we used to do this all over the state and uh, we don't use that technique hardly any anymore, but uh, we compared old data to new data 
in some of the lakes that the, the carp uh, had gotten into. And basically we saw, with this data set, we saw that the carp had replaced the shad. And there were some declines in the abundance of, uh, and the growth rates of uh, sport fish. It's a limited study. It, it, it's troubling. Um, uh, we'd have to do more work, and, and certainly our colleagues in other states could do such work and, and to see if um, they would be impacting, in a negative way, sport fish populations. Um, with regard to commercial fishermen, uh, they tend to um, make it difficult for them to uh, fish effectively. Uh, in terms of uh, fishing for uh, with gill nets for um, catfish, gar, you know, buffalo, carp, uh, they tend to catch in some some locations, mainly uh, the um, the Asian carp. So it's it, it's troubling. Uh, we just have to keep an eye on the situation. Uh, we hope um, that. Uh, it's not going to all be gloom and doom. Um, the thing that, that everybody can do is when, and when you fish or you capture bait in the spillway areas, and we know that we have the Asian carp in the spillway areas, follow the regulation so that you have to immediately put it in all the bait in a dry container or in an ice chest with ice. Because we don't want live Asian carp being spread to other water bodies, okay? Uh, we have some very valuable fisheries in Mississippi, uh, particularly crappie fisheries in our northern reservoirs, and uh, we don't want the uh, Asian carp to get into their, those water bodies. All right, Are they edible? Yeah. Yeah, they're edible. They're pretty good. It's not the best fish I ever ate. But it's pretty good. Uh, carp patties and and uh, fish balls and uh, and Libby could tell you how uh, a freshly uh, caught one has tasted uh, in a frying pan. I know her and her husband uh, have eaten them on the Mississippi River. All right, uh, Mike. Thanks for your call. So, Libby, what do you think? What what's your your review of the Asian carp as a as a meal? Well, I guess first of all we certainly don't like Asian carp, and we're sorry they are in the Mississippi River, but uh, we re- we had a problem with them jumping in our boat, and so we decided we don't throw one back. So if one jumps in our boat, we throw it on the grill, and um, it really is good. Uh, and they grow so fast, you can eat one of the great big ones. You know, they've not bioaccumulated chemicals like we, we worry about eating a, a large catfish, but you can eat a big one, which is easier. There are a lot of bones in them. And the big bones, of course, are easier to remove than a lot of little bones. So we'll usually, um, you know, if we get it, but if we get a small one, we've done it too. You have to watch out for bones in them. But with the big ones, you can't fillet it easily, but um, you can lift that meat off of the bone pretty much leave all their kind of a feathery bone left behind. And um, we think they taste really good on the grill like that. Don't so, overcook it. Um, and so the I think we've talked about this before. We just need to come up with like a fancy name for them so that when they're put on a menu in some high-priced restaurant, people will, will flock to them and start eating them. Yes, and I don't remember the name. But <laughs> well, actually, they, they the do. Left, yeah. And they were, they were experimenting with using them in the restaurant. So. The, the new name, Libby, is Copi for Copius, C-O-P-I. <laughs> That's going to wrap us up for today. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio, and our funding is provided by listeners. To hear today's show or a previous show, visit creaturecomforts.mpbonline.org. Our show was produced today by Java Chapman, and our call screener was Liz Gill. So for Libby Hartfield, Dr. Troy Major, and our guest, Dennis Rickey, I'm Kevin Farrell. Stay tuned up next at 10. It's AutoCorrect, and we'll be back next Thursday at 9 for Creature Comforts, heard only on MPB Think Radio.